Hey everyone, Brandon with Everyday EV here with a unique video. Typically with my videos, I talk about electric vehicles, the, the four wheel version. But for today's video, I am talking about electrification in other aspects of the industry. As you can see behind me, we have the Land District electric bike. And now this bike is super cool. We're here at the factory on the west side of Cleveland. We're gonna dive into the manufacturing process, the history and where these bikes are going. So let's get started. So I want to introduce the founder and CEO of Land. This is Scott Calissimo. Thank you so much, Scott, for having us. Yeah, thanks for being here. <laughs> well, Scott is going to do a quick tour of the facilities. We're gonna see the district where it's made and then we'll get into a discussion. All right, so this is Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, we're gonna walk you quickly through the factory. So you see we have two districts right here. What you see behind me is what we're building out as the factory. Uh, so land is a little bit different uh, with the fact that we're building all of our vehicles here in the U.S. I'll show you our current facility where we are building the bikes right now. Wow. So this is our workshop here. And right now all the vehicles are hand built on lifts. So part of this A investment round that we're doing is we're getting them off the lifts and we're going to get them in the production facility behind you. Um, so these are small run, uh, between about 50 to 100 vehicles we'll do in here, and then we'll transition them to the assembly line uh, right behind us. Awesome. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you what we have here. Uh, so we are doing all of the chassis, um, and you know this is clean for video, but uh, this is a fixture table, so uh, all of our uh, chassis, the tubing is CNC bent, laser coped in Mansfield, Ohio. Okay. Uh, the chassis come here and then we weld them up here. Um, our warehouse and everything is, is where we're storing all the parts. Uh, we're starting to bring some CNC in. Uh, we're doing some hot forging and some castings here. Oh, awesome. Um, this is our layout table. So we're doing a lot of the um, prep work for the body work here. Some of our initial um, body work is actually 3D printed. Oh, cool. Um, so this is either carbon ABS or carbon nylon. Um, so this is kind of one of the examples of uh, toolless manufacturing we're doing here in the US. Okay. And then so, I'll so Scott, what, what's the difference between like carbon nylon and like carbon ABS? Uh, there's not much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a, a big difference when you inject it. Uh, but through 3D printing, the carbon nylon is actually a little bit stronger. Okay. Uh, nylon is a little bit more flexible, we have found. Okay. Um, for production, these are going to be injection molded composite. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, but for uh, right now, just the, the carbon nylon and the carbon ABS are, there's some trade offs. Nylon will absorb water if you don't uh, coat it, like oh. if you don't paint it. Interesting. Okay. Uh, the carbon ABS tends not to absorb water. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. So um, basically, everything you see for manufacturing is, is being housed here right now. Uh, we have a partnership with both Michelin and Pirelli. Okay. Um, so all of our vehicles have DOT wheels. Um, Magura is currently our brake supplier. Okay. Uh, we're also working with Jay Juan for our brakes. Um, so you know what we're doing here is uh, these vehicles are DOT street legal. Mm -hmm. Um, and they can transition anywhere from an e-bicycle. So currently they're class two e-bike. Uh, we can do an e-moped and then they can be classified all the way to a street legal motorcycle. Wow. So part of that is looking at the compliance and what we need to do to make them, make them legal. Yeah, yeah. Um, so right now the stage we're at, a lot of what we're doing is uh, CNC components. Okay. So, you know, what you're seeing, and you know, these are some engineering prototypes here, but uh, we're heavily relying on CNC, and as we get into manufacturing, these are getting transitioned to forged and castings to lower the cost. Okay, interesting. Um, so you can see, actually, 
Um, we have a lot of 3D printers here. Yeah. <laughs> so this is really, I would say the last five years, it's finally got to the point where we can prototype parts with 3D printing. Uh, we don't have to see and see them for the very first shot. So we've even used these. Uh, some of these are continuous strand carbon, uh, which means we can actually, we can get a full, uh, a few pulls off of these yeah. before they uh, implode. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's impressive. But we're yeah. pushing the technology as far as it can go currently. Um, and there are some limitations, but at least for prototyping, we're able to go completely toolless. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, That's and you, great. Can, you can see right now, um, so like some of the things we're doing here, for example, um, so we've gone away from spokes. So these are our own cast wheels. Um, so these wow. are some of our initial pulls right off the molds. Um, so we did do our own cast wheel. Uh, we're doing our own brakes, all of our own discs. So wow. you know, I would say one, one big difference between what land is focused on and where I think most of the industry is, is vertical integration. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to create and, and manufacture as much in-house as we can. Okay. So okay. that's a big, big focus of ours. Uh, so I'm going to take you through our CNC room and then okay. into the design studio. Um, so this is kind of what we call our battery graveyard here. Um, so we have developed and tested a ton of our own packs. Um, and we started with what we call our suitcase pack, which is right here. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is where we started. And we really liked this form factor until we started carrying these batteries around. And then the suitcase is very difficult uh, from a center of gravity. Oh, I can imagine, yeah. So now we've switched to a different form factor, which we call our core pack. Okay. And these are the packs that we're integrating the USB-A, USB-C, the inverters. Um, so we're putting all of the connectivity into our new packs. Oh, perfect. Um, so, you know, a year ago we were here with 18650s. Yeah. Uh, now we're here with our 21700s. In two, three years, you know, if solid state becomes available. Yeah. The idea is that you're going to be able to directly swap that new tech into all of our vehicles. Oh, that's great. Um, so this is the start of our um, kind of CNCing in-house. Um, so one of our investors lent us his VF2. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a three access. So we're able to quickly prototype with 3D printing, uh, quickly prototype with CNC. And then this will also transition to manufacturing. So okay. this is a, we could run this thing 24 seven. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> And it's nice that it fits in this room really easily too. <laughs> it was not so easy to get it. No, so, I'm sure. so this this will go. Uh, we have a CNC room that we're building um, that we're going to have some five access, some robots. So this will go into our CNC room. Okay. We call it our chip room eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go into our design studio now. Um, and as you can see, uh, and these aren't all the um, benchmark vehicles we have, but a big part of what we we did here was to benchmark everything that exists and not repeat the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a, a big thing is uh, we still feel like the Ulta, the Redshift is one of the best um, electric vehicles made, even though this is several years old right now. But we dug into you know, why this thing failed, why the company failed, um, the highlights, the really good uh, aspects of the yeah. bike and what we don't like. Um, what you see here is actually one of our um, technology partnerships. So this inverter is from a company called XRO. Um, so we're creating our own technology, but we're also looking to uh, form partnerships with new technology companies. Okay. So this is yeah. a Canadian, um, they're a publicly listed company and they have a lot of, a, a lot of cash to put into R&D, uh, which yeah. we don't have right now. Okay, yeah. So um, yeah. they've invented what's called a coil driver. Um, so this is a new technology that um, it acts almost like an electronic two-speed gearbox. Oh, interesting. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. electric right now without gearboxes, yeah. um, it's a trade-off between either high torque on the low end mm -hmm. or high speed on the high end. You, you can't get both. Yeah. This, uh, in theory, allows you to do both. Oh, that's really um, interesting. So one of our tech partners right now uh, is XRO. And, you know, this is, this is a, a breadboard inverter, and we are now trying to shrink this down and basically right size this, right size this to our vehicle. Okay. Um, and of course, That's... we have 
more benchmark vehicles in, in yeah. the back as well. Yeah, here. yeah that, that's really interesting. Like I, I've driven the uh, the Taycan with the two-speed yeah. gearbox, and it, it it was unlike any electric vehicle I've driven. I yeah. mean, it definitely improved the performance and oh, yeah. all the driving aspects. You get the low end torque, but yeah. then you get that efficiency at the high end. Exactly. So what yeah. this is attempting to do is eliminate the gearbox altogether. Wow. And do it electronically. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So you know, there's certain things that we're creating here from you know battery tech, battery management, mm -hmm. um, driver technology. Technology, uh, vehicle communication, so a vehicle communication unit. Uh, there's other things that we partner with tech companies to say, hey, can they do it better than us? Yeah. Um, and especially when you have a large R&D budget, a lot of times you can get there a lot quicker. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's great. <laughs> um, so what you see behind us is actually um, some development of another vehicle we're working on. Um, and, you know, we're always pushing. So the district is where we, we've started. Um, but now we're pushing into, um, let's say, somewhat more affordable vehicles, mm -hmm. uh, more focused on high volume. And pretty much most of the creation of the vehicle happened at this table. Um, so that's that's small team, very um, capable. Yeah. Um, so this is our, you know, currently our, our small design studio. Um, and, you know, we don't have a ton of uh, equipment here, but we we use everything we have to the best of our ability. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, this is a good example of being small, lean, and, and having to work within our means. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we went out to the, uh, the companies that are making the 150 to quarter million dollar 3D printers, mm -hmm. and we said, show us what you got. Uh, and then we went to Raise 3 d which is like a $6,000 3D printer. And, you know, between Henry and Evan, they were able to get results out of these fairly inexpensive 3D printers that are actually better than the quarter million dollar machines. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is us looking at where the industry is, where the technology is, and using it to the best of our ability. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah when we first got here, we were seeing some of the, the sample printing, and it's unbelievable what you guys are doing. Yeah, so the, yeah. these guys are getting 3D prints with that carbon nylon to mm -hmm. the point where they're almost indistinguishable from injection molding. Wow. Um, so the only, I would say the only thing that's holding us back from taking 3D print to production is just the amount of time. And we're talking yeah. between 20 to 50 hours per print. Yeah. It's, yeah. You can't produce vehicles like that. Yeah. Um, and then up here, if you see, so this is actually where we started. Um, that was one of the very first uh, electric vehicles we, we started working on. And we quickly got to the stage where we didn't see any, really any value going uh, kind of bottom up, mm -hmm. so we just started uh, decided to go top down, right? Really look at the where the technology is and, and pushing that more affordable. So if we really look at where land is pushing from the technology standpoint mm -hmm. and and what our focus is, we're heavily focused on design. And a lot of people think design is about sketching, but what design is about really developing the whole process mm -hmm. behind the user the user interface, appropriate technology, and really what is best for the consumer that's buying the product. Okay. So if you look at our battery packs, just from a scale, we started with around two kilowatt hour packs. Okay. And that was really based on usability. So if you look at where the other uh, two wheel vehicle manufacturers are focused, they're almost trying to replace gas, big, heavy gas bikes mm -hmm. with big, heavy electric bikes. Yeah, yeah. And after using and riding these big, heavy electric bikes, they don't do anything that the gas does as well as the gas does. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at is why try to beat gas at a game that we can't compete? Uh, we looked at what actually adds benefit to the consumer. Okay. And what added benefit to the consumer was creating uh, small city bikes, that also have some extended range. So in theory, and I say theory, uh, because electric is all about how you use it. Yes, exactly. Um, so in theory, yeah. two of our packs can go around 80 miles. Okay. Um, but that all depends on how you use it. Yeah. And uh, we figured there was really uh, never a scenario that the consumer would need to go more than 80 miles in the city, around town, or mm -hmm. even um, you know, off-road for, for pleasure for, for short trips. Mm -hmm. Um, so the focus started with swappable packs and this idea that you could plug them into any standard outlet. Um, so around two kilowatt hours, uh, depending on uh, how you can charge them, mm -hmm. between two to six hours from empty to full. 
Okay. Um, and That's not bad. It's, it's not bad. Yeah. And, and all of our pa all of our bikes fit two packs. Okay. Um, so then we started looking at the usability, and we started to say, okay, well, if you can go about 40 miles per hour on or 40 miles per charge on one pack, yeah. What can you do on the other pack? Um, and and looking at the whole ecosystem behind not just riding, but how we how we use electricity, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that we always have a, a cell phone on us. We almost always have iPads or computers on us. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we don't always have to work in the factory anymore, right? We can yeah. go elsewhere to work. Yeah. yeah. But our laptops, if you're doing CAD or you're doing anything heavy, you get maybe a half hour out of them. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to kill your battery. You kill it. <laughs> so um, if you look at where we were with our, what we call our suitcase packs to where we transitioned uh, to more of our brick packs or mm -hmm. which we're calling our core packs. Okay. We started getting something that was um, highly portable, right? Around mm -hmm. 25 pounds. Wow, that's not bad. Uh, you know, yeah. two kilowatt hours of, of energy. And then we started looking at, well, what connectivity do we have to put into these packs to make them useful outside of the bike? Mm -hmm. So we figured at the very least an inverter that can um, power your computer or some of your devices. Uh, USB-A and USB-C was essential. Definitely. And now that more computers are uh, focused on the USB-C, mm -hmm. now we can do DC to DC native charging for almost all devices. Oh, that's awesome. So we started yeah. to look at the battery and what we call our connectivity module. Um, so this was kind of our, our next evolution. And now we're here with our core pack and what we're calling our core plus pack. Okay. So the core plus is for someone who's really just focused on riding. Mm -hmm. So this is for the consumer that's like, well, I don't really care about the connectivity. I'll plug a few things in, but I don't really want to pull the pack out. Okay. The core packs are highly focused on that consumer that wants to do more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you can have, let's say, one to four of these packs as a battery backup in your home. Okay. You can have one to two of these packs that go anywhere with you. You could ride to where you want to go on one pack. You can pull the other pack and use it to work on anything yeah. from, you know, let's say you're building something outside and you just need to charge the batteries for your cordless drills. Mm -hmm. Or let's say you want to go to the beach, you know, Edgewater's 500 feet from here, yeah. Edgewater Park. Yeah. Let's say you just want to go to the beach and work on your computer for a couple hours. Yeah. You can now do that. That's awesome. <laughs> so when I say we're really design focused or design driven, mm -hmm. The idea is what's offering increased benefit to the consumer. Okay. So transportation's good, mm -hmm. transportation's great, but there's a new paradigm on how the electricity is being used. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're looking at all the benefit behind, yes, this can get you point A to point B, what else can it do? And we're really at the start of, of pushing this connectivity. Okay. So I, I do have a question. I think when you and I first met, you mentioned like the digital nomad. Yeah. So do these battery packs have like some type of like Wi-Fi connection or like hotspot that's going to need to be part of them? Yeah. So okay. if you look at the vehicle and where we're at, mm -hmm. um, so, so let's, let's talk about that in a second. Okay. Let's talk yeah. about where we are from a, a concept for land. Mm -hmm. So we're doing electric vehicles and our focus really is sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, and sustainability to us is the whole ecosystem around how you use things, right? Yeah, exactly. So what we're looking at with the vehicles right now is, well, when the technology improves, how do we improve the tech in our vehicles? Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is the vehicle can last 20 years, right? The technology and the chassis and the vehicle itself isn't going to change, yeah. but the technology and the battery packs, the inverters, yep. and the connectivity will change. Exactly. So yeah. the idea is, um, like, a, let's say you own a Tesla right now, one of the first Teslas, and you paid $100,000 for it. Mm -hmm. Today, if that Tesla is 10 years old, you're going to be paying 35000 and a lot of time to get that pack changed. Mm -hmm. It's got to go back to a dealer. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to... Um, rip the guts out of the whole vehicle to, yeah. to put a, a really heavy, massive pack back yeah. in. Yeah. The idea be, behind our tech is that you simply swap it out and the vehicle remains. And then these old cells, these old packs, they can be reconfigured for battery banks outside of, of the vehicle. Okay. Um, so this tech that's... can last many, many life cycles. Yeah. I was going to say that's true sustainability. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So now 
if we're talking about the digital nomad or usability. Mm -hmm. So the paradigm right now, more or less, is 4G transitioning to 5G, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we have our connectivity module right now um, that will most likely have a 4G um, connectivity. Okay. So let's say okay. Wi-Fi and, and 4G connectivity. We know that 5G and maybe even 6G is coming very quickly. Mm -hmm. So the idea is make this swappable without tools. Yeah, yeah. Make it easy for the consumer. Make it easy for the consumer yeah. to upgrade when the tech gets there. Okay, um, that makes sense. So we don't, I don't personally think that the consumer is going to pay 60 bucks a month today yeah. to, um, to have their bike connected. Uh, but soon, I, I think the consumer might be willing to use the, the batteries, the vehicle, the bike as a hotspot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we're not going to roll it out right away with connectivity. That'll be something we release down the road. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, because it, it's, a, it's a big ask to say, hey, yeah. pay a subscription 60 bucks a month just to have a hotspot on your bike. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think the consumer's quite there yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Definitely good to have as an option. That's right. Yeah. And uh, we're working on tech where you can use your phone, the GPS, and you can use all of the data and everything from your phone mm -hmm. to interface with the vehicle. Okay. So y you can currently uh, interface, but, but we're, we're not... We're not adding the connectivity in the vehicle right now. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. So. I do have a question about drivability. So the larger pack right here, um, I, I know a single pack has 80 miles of range. Mm -hmm. What speed is that at? Is that like if you're driving constantly at 65 miles per hour, or is that like a mix of that's, drivability? That's a good question. So we have three ride modes. So there's e-bike mode, mm -hmm. which is limited to 25 and limited to about 750 watts. Okay. And that's strictly based on legality. Um, so that's one mode. Okay. Uh, we have ride mode two, which is what we're calling e-moped mode, um, that is limited to basically about 1.2 horsepower uh, and 37 miles per hour. And we have two other modes that are more or less unlimited. Okay. Um, so in vehicles, the, well, especially motorcycles, you have a large frontal mass, right? You're, yeah. a, you're a sail. Yeah. The faster you go, the quicker you'll kill the packs. Okay. So... Um, at 65 or 70 miles per hour, you're gonna get nowhere near that range. Okay. Um, and we're seeing this on every electric two-wheel vehicle. Yeah, I was gonna um, say. So you might be able to get 40 miles range on a pack. Okay. Um, where the sweet spot really is for these vehicles is like 25 to around 37 miles per hour. Okay. That's where you're gonna get maximum range. And if you limit your initial amperage draw, Yeah. so if you're a little more ginger, that's where you get uh, the max amount of range. Okay. Um, if you're full speed, you know, if you're hucking it and you're really on it, yeah. um, do we have any figures on full, full blown? The very, the very least you'll get 25 miles. Per pack? Yeah. Okay. So, like that's, you're having a lot of fun. You're having yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah, I was about to say yeah. at that point, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah so which at the, would probably be how I would ride if I had a lot of experience. That's right. So at the, at the very minimum, uh, you'll get around 50 miles for two packs. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's, I mean, that's still a good ride. And that's the thing is... When you, when you think about how you actually ride in the city, yeah. 50 miles is a lot more than you actually think it is. Yeah. It's, I mean, that is a significant amount of like, riding. So yeah. it's, uh, you'll be tired if you go out fast. I was about to say, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. I got to switch batteries. Yeah, dude. At the very least, around 55 to 60 miles. So this is, you know... You're tapping out at 25 miles if you're really on ass. Yeah. This yeah. is, I mean, you're at the very least you're gonna get 55 miles. Wow. And that's pretty incredible for at least the bikes in our category and how you actually use it. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a, a pretty significant difference. So. so obviously the district is a really unique and cool bike. Can you explain like the concept behind it? Sure. Um, so we're focused on something that we've coined the term emoto. Okay. So if you look at where the where the industry is right now, we've talked about, they're really focusing on transitioning gas to electric. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, um, it's different than where we're focused. So they're doing 300 to 400 pound bikes, even 700 pound electric bikes, yeah. and yeah. they're trying to compete with gas on a very, very high level. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, I, I watched your channel and it seems like your consumers they know a little bit more about electric than most. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the amount of power in one gallon of gas, we would have to have a 50 kilowatt hour pack on a bike 
to be able to put out that much to, to compete. Wow. So it's, it's not competitive right now on the, on the top end. Yeah. So wow. the focus on the Emoto is lightweight and, and city use. Okay. Um, because we've talked about the faster you go on a vehicle, the more frontal mass, the, the less, really the less uh, mileage you get per charge. Mm -hmm. So we've limited the max speed to around 80 miles per hour. Okay. Uh, production, we're going to release around 65 for the production bikes because we can um, get a lot more usage out of that. Yeah, yeah. And the packs, uh, 1.8, and this one was 4.8, four and a half to five kilowatt hours. So, okay. uh, you know, each one of these packs between 25 to 50 miles per charge. But for the consumer that says, you know, I, like, I don't care about the swappability, I just yeah. want maximum range and, and fun, yeah. uh, we're able to get a little bit more power out of the, the bigger pack, our Core Plus, for those consumers that just really want to have fun with the vehicle. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, these are still going to have the connectivity and the functionality. It's just at 48 pounds, they're not as mobile yeah. as the 25-pound yeah. the pack. Yeah. Um, yeah. And to be clear, these are still our breadboards. Um, so our final packs are in tooling. Okay. So the final packs aren't just uh, steel boxes. Uh, they're, they're a lot nicer. And then, you know, our, our breadboard um, kind of mock-ups we're past this stage right now, but we're not showing it. Today. Okay, okay, yeah. that sounds good. Um, but you at least get an idea of the size and scale of the packs. Yeah. So, question about the battery. I know a lot of um, electric motorcycles do air cooled, some do liquid cooled. Mm -hmm. Are these air cooled? Yeah, so the liquid cooled is only really necessary for two things. Um, if you're doing massive, massive amperage discharge. Okay. And really for level two or level three charging. Okay. I don't personally think that motorcycle riders want to go sit in a parking lot for three to four hours to charge. Yeah. yeah. So the focus here is our chargers are their dual, uh, they have the dual ability to do 240 okay. or 110. Okay. So let's say you have a 240 plug in your home, you'll charge about twice as fast on, on your average pack. Mm -hmm. That same charger can be used on a standard outlet. Okay. So our focus is take these into your work when you ride. You plug them in, in three hours you're topped up. Yeah. So, so the yeah. idea behind, again, the, the design and the usability is these live with you. Um, and especially if you're in the city and you just want to, you know, pop into Starbucks and, and yeah. have a coffee. Yeah. Take it in, top it up, in an hour you're ready to ride. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a different concept and, and it's a, the whole ecosystem behind the vehicle. So the other thing is these packs fit in all of our vehicles. So instead of this siloed approach of, you know, one car here, you have another car here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the packs can be used as battery backup in your home. They can be cross-functional between all of our vehicles. And then uh, let's say you just want to go camping and you don't even want to take the bike and you just want something to power your, your camping for the week or weekend. Mm -hmm. Combine this with a few solar panels and now you have power for an entire week off-grid. Yeah, that's so fantastic. It, there, there's a whole... Yeah. There's a whole concept behind what we're doing. And yeah. if you look at it, it's, yes, e-motors, the, the motorcycles are cool, mm -hmm. but the energy independence, uh, power continuity, the idea that you have power all the time. Yeah. Um, our, yeah. our power went out last night at home. Yeah. I had a pack. I just plugged a few <laughs> things in, you know, yeah. five or six hours yeah. without power was a problem. Yeah. So That's a long time. <laughs> it's this idea that um, it's just a slight slightly different shift in, in thinking yeah. behind that this is no longer a static gas tank mm -hmm. on a vehicle. This yeah. can just do a lot more. Yeah, yeah, and I think once you take that perspective, you can really shift the consumer's mind on e-mobility. That's right. Yeah, you can it, do a lot with it. <laughs> it enhances, it yeah. doesn't detract. Exactly. And the issue yeah. with the big bikes right now is they're really a detraction, Yeah. right? Gas yeah. is still doing better at a 1,000 cc than electric can do. Mm -hmm. I mean, electric will get you there just as quick. Yeah. The problem is you can't hold enough energy to sustain. Yeah, So. yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, that's so, it's just impressive. It's fun. Yeah, it is, yeah. it and, is, and I love it. What's crazy is, a year ago, we were at the 18650. Yeah. Um, so you know, the 18650 is like a double A. Right? Okay, yeah, yeah, it's um, not a cylinder. And we've switched to the 21700s, which are like a C battery. Okay. So now we have less batteries, we have less connections, 
Uh, we have uh, less structure and, and we have a lot less parts in here. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're talking about you know, liquid air, you're talking about you know, different silicons, yeah. solid states. We're not quite there yet, but we're going to look at we're, so, so we have so from here to here we have higher energy energy density already. Mm -hmm. And in three years, where are we going to be? Your vehicle's still going to exist. You can still ride it, and yeah. we're going to swap out the energy. That's awesome. Yeah. So then, um, I know you mentioned like you are designing like future vehicles. Like once those are launched, consumers can just take these battery packs and switch it That's to right. that new one. That's right. Okay. So let's say um, let's say you got into the district and you love it and you're, you want to do 60 miles per hour mm -hmm. and you want a full-blown motorcycle, yeah. the packs are good for that. Let's say your family members are not motorcyclists and they don't really care to do that. We're offering some more accessible vehicles, more accessible price and speeds mm -hmm. that the same packs will be cross-functional between all of them. That's great. And then let's say you have two or three vehicles at your home and you have four batteries, Yeah. then you have a big battery bank to smooth out if, if your power goes out. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, that's just pure sustainability, yeah. thinking in the future. That's awesome. Yeah, it's funny. I, I remember when we were going to attend the event last year, and then obviously everything happened yeah. with the pandemic. I remember seeing this design. So it's really cool to see the progress you guys have made in a year. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's all about we used them. Mm -hmm. We gave them the consumers to use. Yeah. And, you know, carrying, and we took the handles off these, but mm -hmm. by carrying these around, and the, the, the idea with the suitcase pack was that you know, you can, you can kind of, you can slide it into a pack. Yeah. That it, it, it was, from a concept standpoint, it was very usable mm -hmm. until we used it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the consumers are like, this is, yeah. it does, you know, when you're outside, it doesn't stand up very well. It wants yeah. to fall over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it doesn't store very easily. So heavy. going with something more like a brick really, uh, it just made sense. Yeah, yeah. So um, just, uh, uh, well, I guess this is more of like an engineering question. What does this do for like the, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank, the uh, center of gravity for like the bike? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. We benchmarked a lot of vehicles mm -hmm. and a lot of the vehicles get wrong the center of gravity. Okay. They put the center of gravity too high. Okay. So what we did is we moved our motor as far down as possible and we were able to get it farther uh, towards the, the ground than most because we're using a jack shaft. Oh, okay. Um, so we okay. were able to drop our center of gravity almost 12 inches. Wow. Which meant we were able to take our packs even lower to the ground than most. Um, wow. So by offering a brick pack, so, so these packs were, um, were side by side, mm -hmm. which um, you couldn't really tell because at 25, 30 pounds, it's, it's not a big deal. Yeah. But yeah. it still was was uncentered. Okay. The new packs go front to rear, um, and we have almost a perfect 50/50 weight distribution with these packs. Oh, awesome! Between the wheels, very low. Yeah. Um, and just a center of gravity from moving these things around is a lot easier. Yeah. So you know the idea here is we're going to be offering backpacks and different different items to be able to take the energy off the vehicle and, and with you. Oh, awesome. Okay. okay, so not only just a bike, but accessories to live with. From a lifestyle standpoint, yeah. um, you know, a lot of this is driven by our team's usage. Yeah. So we like okay. to camp, we like to go hiking, we like to go off road. Uh, we'd like to go to races, you know, even at mid Ohio where you have no power. Yeah. So yeah. just having a power bank with you, yeah. we can still work. Uh, you know, we're running a, a company yeah. that we, we never shut down, yeah. right? Yeah, so always if, moving. Yeah, yeah, if you could sneak out for a few days and still work, yeah. that's a huge benefit. Oh, absolutely. And just having yeah. a mobile power unit that you could do that with is, is yeah. very advantageous. So. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> you said like you could use this as a power wall. Are you guys planning on selling anything you can integrate with your home where you just have like a bank of batteries, you can pop them in when you get home and they're also helping power your house? So right now, um, the charger is going to be... Um, what's connected mm -hmm. and so when Ford comes out and says oh you can plug your vehicle into your house great yeah. I I set our house up to be able to do what's called a push-pull system okay fifteen thousand dollars later I can do that but I still don't have a battery bank yeah. and I still don't have solar panels so this that's what I'm saying is the the industry is sort of lying to the consumers right now, mm -hmm. right? It's all blue sky and they don't talk about the reality. Mm -hmm. So we had to put in a transfer switch 
which is very expensive. Um, and all a transfer switch does is it allows power to come in, push-pull from different sources. Okay. So the transfer switch allows power to come in from our battery bank, our solar panel, the grid, or a vehicle. Okay. So to do a transfer switch is very expensive, especially the kind of power we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And then on top of that, uh, code in Ohio makes you have two separate panels. So there are certain loads that we have that are being fed off that transfer switch. I couldn't afford to run the whole house off of the transfer switch. So th that's what we're, when I say design driven, again, design is not just fancy sketches. Yeah. Design is usability. Yeah, functionality. So we went yeah. out and we said, let's look at what the consumer would have to do to make this F-150 actually charge your house. Mm -hmm. And what a pain in the butt. What a, a lot of money. Yeah. And then one of our investors actually put the money down to put in a power wall. So at first the power wall was 35,000, and then it was 55,000, and then it was $110,000. With all the equipment, the power wall, in Ohio right now where we live, there is not an approved power wall installer. That's without a warranty. Wow. There's no warranty with that. So they're like, okay, wow. our house is 190,000. Yeah. By the time we put a solar bank on in a power wall, yeah. we're gonna pay more for energy independence than we would for the house. Yeah. So like it's yeah. absurd, they canceled it. So what we're looking at is, where is the consumer right now? Mm -hmm. This will allow you to dip your feet into energy independence. Mm -hmm. um, you can get some small, small solar banks right now. Let's say your energy goes out, you throw them on the lawn, and you could have a true emergency backup power. Yeah, yeah. We're working on grid connectivity. Now the issue is, getting out of that old idea of you have to have an electrician come out mm -hmm. who's authorized to install it. Yeah. And that's what we haven't got past yet. Mm -hmm. um, because um, let's say like Henry or let's say like our team here where they're living in apartments or condos, why would they put a solar, why would they put a bank on the roof and a, why would they connect it and yeah. then move? Yeah. Um, yeah. So what we're looking at is this will allow you to smooth out that. And you know, Cleveland, the power here is not consistent. No. It's going down <laughs> once a week, yeah. right? Oh yeah, um, you know, all the time. Uh, with the emerald necklace and with you know, green city on a blue lake and all that, yeah. there's a lot of trees. Yeah. And what do trees do? They take down power lines. Exactly. Right? <laughs> um, exactly. So it's a, a big roundabout way of saying, again, we're looking at where the tech is. Mm -hmm. And you can get into energy independence, you can get into um, you know, solar panels at a few thousand dollars versus 50 to 100,000. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that will come. We have not figured out a way to do that in a, in a way that, that isn't very expensive. Okay. Um, and that transfer switch, all, that, all yeah. that tech you have to put into your house is it's, yeah, it's very expensive. Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see how the industry goes when a lot of that is like pulled out from under the rug and like consumers are made aware of that. Because I, I know for me, like as I start doing research on like electric cars, there's so much of this industry that I still don't know. Vaporware too. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of this whole hand waving mm -hmm. without any real plan on how to transition this. Yeah, yeah. so it's concerning. <laughs> let's talk about your power goes down. You need to work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You can take one of our packs. You can plug your router into it. You can plug your computer into it. You can plug your phone into it. You can work. Yeah. You're connected. You're, you have power, and, and you, can, you can work for a few days. You can have a solar panels attached to a second battery. Yeah. And when this battery runs out, you can swap them. Yeah. Um, yes, it's a little bit more work than seamless you know, Voodoo integration, yeah. Yeah. but it's, it's where we're at. Yeah. Um, it's real. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and that's, I think that's what small companies have the ability to do, mm -hmm. is we have the ability to look at where it's at. Yeah. We don't have to do multi-billion dollar things right now. Yeah. We have to say what is addressing consumer need and how do we push that to market? Oh, absolutely. I honestly, I think it's the small companies that are going to shift this entire industry. Yeah. It's obvious that all, a lot of these OEMs, like they're, they're focused on what built them and how they got there. That's right. But the startups and like the small companies are the innovators. That's right. Yeah. Well, and if you look at, okay, so let's say you're building cars with uh, stamping mm -hmm. and body shops. You have all this infrastructure built up. Mm -hmm. And now you want to change how you do things. Yeah, it's very difficult uh, and um, expensive too. Well, and then what <laughs> yeah. you know what you have to under what you have to try to do is 
still explain to consumers that your gas has value mm -hmm. while then trying to transition them to electric, which is very, very difficult. Yeah, very muddy. Um, because yeah. what we know is once you get a taste of electric, mm -hmm. th there are people that are like, I don't like this, I'm gonna go back, Yeah. right? Oh yeah. But once you yeah. really understand how different and how advantageous it is, mm -hmm. you're never going back. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. yeah. I, I will never go back. So now imagine but. you need to drive profitability from a manufacturing standpoint, mm -hmm. selling gas while also trying to transition your entire business to electric. It's yeah. very difficult. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a billion dollar gamble. Yeah. 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 And I mean, we're seeing that now. I mean, there's a lot of companies that invest all this money and then they never, you know, yeah. Yeah. They yeah. never produce anything. Well, I think we're in the sweet spot right now. You know, is it, I think uh, like Malcolm Gladwell and Andrew Car Carnegie said, like, it's important to be smart, mm -hmm. but it's better to be lucky, yeah. right? Like yeah. we're lucky because the industry is where we need it, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, the Bramos that came before us and mm -hmm. the Altas, they were too early, way too early. Um, now what we're seeing is the industry as a whole has recognized we need to change, we're going yeah. to change, yeah. and there's a whole movement uh, with transportation, energy generation, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, grid to grid, push pull systems. There's a you know, char the charging networks. Yeah. There is a whole focus on how do we move the entire industry forward. Yeah. And yeah. we're lucky because we're in the right place at the right time. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So. No, this is great. Thank you so much, Scott, for showing us this. So let's talk around the vehicles a little bit yeah, because that's.